Well, thank you so much, Paul. I want to uh, thank you and Dr. Charlie. It's wonderful to see you both. I'm also really indebted to Mike Marino. A uh, shout out to you. Thank you so much for your, your Buffalo vibe and connecting with me and inviting you to the club. I've enjoyed the, the rapport with, with you and so many people. And I actually recognized faces of, of those that I saw. And uh, mm -hmm. when Bill turned his uh, camera around, uh, we saw Trudy who won the door prize of the book. So I Trudy, hope you yeah. enjoyed it as well. But um, I want to share a little bit about what our time together will include as I start to share the screen here. So um, hopefully you can see that. We can, uh, sir. It is good. Thank good. you. Good. Okay. Well, um, the the topic is Niagara Falls and philately, but really there's a lot besides that that I'd like to uh, share with you over the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, there's obviously talk about stamps and will uh, my connection with Niagara Falls as well as my family's connection. And uh, we'll share certainly of some postal history. And uh, it'll also be like a travel log. You'll probably think that I've got some kind of travel agent job and I'm trying to make a cut for everybody that heads over to Niagara Falls. But the fact of the matter is that I, I love the place. I grew up uh, outside of Buffalo and have probably been there about 50 times in my life. Every time a uh, family member, a cousin or whoever would come in from out of town or a, a friend or maybe a business associate of dad's, we always went to the falls. And so I just fell in love with it. And uh, this is a travel poster um, of, from 1925, encouraging people to enjoy the falls. And people have been going there for hundreds of years, actually. This is a, a picture of people there enjoying a stroll on a nice afternoon in the 1800s. And Niagara Falls, they uh, harnessed it to generate power towards the end of the 1800s. And that's what powered the lights at the Pan American Exposition. There were over almost a quarter million lights that illuminated the uh, buildings at the Expo, and that's what they were showcasing. They called it the City of Lights, and for people that had never seen electricity before, it was a really big deal. So um, it was, uh, uh, Niagara had such an impact on Western New York. And I guess it's about, uh, let's see, uh, 100 and 18 years ago, my family had their picture taken there. This is my great grandfather and great grandmother. And uh, there's my grandfather and my great aunts. And uh, they had this picture taken at the falls, uh, quite a, a traditional thing for some families to do. And about 70 years after that, my picture was taken at the falls when I was a youngster. And uh, as I said, I fell in love with the place and really enjoyed going back there. I've collected a lot of different books and pamphlets. Uh, they've got so many gift shops at different areas there that uh, here's what I've accumulated and enjoyed reading about over the years. A little bit more of my collection includes 969 postcards related to Niagara Falls. And it's been a, a thrill to uh, add to those and hopefully I can get up to a thousand someday. And uh, here's some that are in packet form. You may uh, recognize these type of things that uh, uh, were common at the time. You'd open it up and there's a outfold, a, a whole bunch of them. Uh, and one of the neatest little things I have was a, a set of 20 very small black and white photos of Niagara Falls and uh, some miniature photographs, probably sold in one of those same gift shops. But in the 1920s, the postal post office department had the Bureau of Engraving and Printing come up with this photo essay of a 20 cent stamp. Well, it was never issued, but this one was in 1931. It's Scott catalog number 699. And I, I just love this stamp. It's very simple, distinctive. I think it's a classic design. Um, some may, may seem that it's, it's, it's Spartan, but it, it just brings the, the falls to light there. I really enjoy it. And, uh, Here's a, a nice block of 40 of that and a first day cover. Uh, this is uh, from July 27th, 1931. There were no really caches at the time. People sometimes added them later or someone put first day cover on here. And there's other cancellations that do not have this 
uh, address, address your mail to street and number on it that have popped up. One of my favorite uh, items that I have is this postcard. And uh, it's a linen postcard and uh, from the 30s. And uh, the stamp is on the picture side rather than on the address and the, uh, uh, the notice side, the, the part where you can write your little note. But uh, I really like this simple item. And uh, from this vantage point, this is what you would see today. This is the actual falls in person. And uh, some more philatelic items include these pre-cancels from the 1930s. There were so many, so many different kinds. You can see there's different um, uh, fonts here as well, different sizes. So pre-cancel collectors could have a field day looking for those as well. Um, Niagara Falls was also noted on this 1948 cover. There were a number of bridges, and we're going to talk about those in a little bit, um, connecting Canada and the United States. And this stamp issued in 1948 uh, has the what's called the Lower Arch Bridge, and uh, it, it is uh, commemorating a century of friendship. has a, a simple handmade cachet there, but uh, uh, a nice thing to commemorate that stamp on its first day. Next up is a, an airmail stamp from 1999. It's Scott's C-133. Now this is the American Falls that is shown on the left-hand side. And uh, uh, there's a, a first day booklet that looks like this. And this was, came from the dedication of the stamp uh, on uh, May 12th, 1999. I particularly like part of this um, uh, writing on the left, it talks about that the falls is beautiful, romantic, overpowering, somehow rather frightening. It can charm you and also kill you. And its flimsy mists are enchanting. The violence that makes the mists is certainly something to think twice about. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's just a nice little keepsake, uh, not an expensive item at all, but uh, a commemoration of that first day of issue. Next up is a first day cover from then. And this has Annie Taylor on it, who was the first person to go over the Horseshoe Falls in a barrel and live. This was uh, uh, in October of 1901. You can see her with a cat there. She'd actually <laughs> put a cat over the falls in a barrel a few days before, and the cat lived. So she uh, had an offer to make some money to go over the falls, and she did. Uh, they pulled her out of the barrel, kind of beat up and a little bloody, but... Uh, uh, she did it for financial reasons and uh, uh, didn't make much money the rest of her life off it, but she certainly had bragging rights, as we all know. Uh, there's actually 16 people that have lived going over the falls. Over 5,000 people have gone over, most of them either uh, uh, by mistake or uh, through suicide. And uh, there's about... Uh, there's quite a number of suicides every year that most of them aren't uh, noted in the paper, but they certainly still occur. People just jump in the rapids further up and uh, over the falls they go. Here's a, a postcard, uh, UXC-13, an airmail postcard uh, issued for tour tourism year. It's got uh, the American Falls here and then a nice photographic cachet from Artcraft on the left. And there's another postcard from 1991 in the America the Beautiful series. I like that they put a little rainbow here coming up from the mist. And uh, this has a, a silk cachet there uh, in the, uh, on the left-hand side. So the United States certainly isn't the only country to honor Niagara Falls. Canada has done so as well. This is a, a, what a, a nice classic stamp from the 30s. This is 1935, Scott's number 225. It, uh, interestingly enough, is from the United States side perspective, looking over at the Canadian side. And here in the distance is the mist from what we know as the Horseshoe Falls. So uh, uh, there's another Canadian stamp from 2009. And uh, this is black and white image. And I believe it's it shows it in winter. This looks to be a winter shot of the falls. Maybe it's just mist. And then uh, beneath it is a colorful shot of the falls at night when they put the colorful lights on it. It's really a treat if you ever go to enjoy the uh, falls in the evening. They keep the lights on depending on what time of year till 10 o'clock or sometimes midnight in the summer. So it, it is a really thrilling 
um, attraction to see. This stamp was on the cover of a, a journal that uh, serviced New York Philatelic Societies. And uh, there we show the American Falls on the left with the Horseshoe Falls in the background. And uh, besides standard postage uh, that's honored here, and we've talked about, there was other mail. This is a postcard called Rocket Mail. And somebody came up with the brilliant idea that they could sell postcards and stamps or labels that we'll see and put them on letters. And they could then put this in mail bags and send it from the United States side over the Niagara Gorge to the Canadian side by rocket. And uh, what an idea that was. Well, here's some of the uh, Cinderella stamps as we'd call them today, uh, but they were actually used. This went from the United States to Canada, 50 cents or 75 cents, depending on the uh, weight of the item. Uh, this is a neat cover that says buy rocket uh, or rocket mail in the, uh, on the little label there. But uh, the idea may have been a good one, but it certainly was short lived because after the first time when they sent it over the gorge, uh, they had to nix the idea because they had no idea where the rocket would end up on the Canadian side, and it was a safety issue. So that was the end of rocket mail, but it sure made some nice Philatelic collectibles. So you may have seen this stamp before, certainly those that may be familiar with me and my book or my work. Uh, this is associated with William B. Hale. He's the huckster in my book, a stamp merchant from Williamsville, Massachusetts, and he had a fellow in Paris create this stamp with his name on it for the 1901 Pan American Exposition. And this shows the uh, Horseshoe Falls and the Maid of the Mist boat there. This is one of two designs. Here's the other design associated with Mr. Hale, the bridge and whirlpool. This shows the water after it's gone over the falls going down the Niagara River through the gorge underneath this bridge uh, at the time. Now, for each of these two stamps, there are 43 different uh, different varieties of them of the two designs. There are different uh, outer frames, different color outer frames, and different color center vignettes, which makes for a total of 86 total stamps uh, in the collection. There's also another uh, five imperfs in addition to that. But it is really difficult to acquire an, a complete set. I've been collecting for 53 years and have one complete set. And I thought I had a second, but it's missing two color stamps. So my second set has 84 stamps and I hope someday I can find the second two. But uh, these were associated with Mr. Hale. Around the same time for the Pan American Exposition, this envelope came out from the Singer uh, Sewing Company, Singer Manufacturing Company. Uh, many obviously uh, sewing machines came from them. Beautiful artwork on it. Uh, shows the American Falls on the left. If you look closely in the middle here, there's this skinny falls. That's called the Bridal Falls uh, because it looks like a bridal veil. So, um, and then here's the Horseshoe Falls towards the right half of it behind it. I've also seen this cover issued by a typewriter company as well. And that one's a little bit more difficult to locate. So um, this sells for about $50 and the typewriter one might be another $25 or so. Here's some more Cinderella stamps. These, I believe, came from the 1950s. Uh, they show a variety of, of photographic images of the falls. Uh, sheet one and sheet two are indicated on the sides there, as well as the company and their address. Since there's no zip code on the address, I can only guess that they were before, uh, they were maybe 1950s or uh, early 60s before uh, zip code went into uh, play there. So uh, uh, a variety of interesting scenes. And uh, here's another different uh, set of Cinderella's. I actually got these from the APS store at stamps.org. And uh, they not only have Niagara Falls related images, but here is Fort Niagara. That was uh, one of the final battles of the War of 1812. Uh, and that was uh, in Fort Erie, just across from Buffalo. Uh, here's some more of the uh, stamps in this series. Uh, Horseshoe Falls from the Maid of the Mist Boat and Bridges. And here's some more of these rounded out. These are vertical Cinderella's in that same set. So 
let's give you a kind of an idea, especially for those that may not have been to Western New York or Canada yet. Here's a map of the region. Now, Buffalo is here on the right-hand side. This is Western New York. And you can see that Lake Erie is at the bottom of the map. And the water from Lake Erie flows into the Niagara River here. It's called the Upper Niagara River. It goes on either side of Grand Island. And uh, it's the Tonawanda side here and the Chip, uh, Chippewa side on the, the left. But it, it uh, gets around Grand Island and, and the rapid starts close to this black line and the water goes over the black line, which is Niagara Falls, into the uh, Niagara Gorge and to the lower Niagara River into uh, Lake Ontario down the way there. And uh, the difference is about 345 feet in height from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario. So gravity is pretty much what gets the water to flow down here and uh, make its journey to Lake Ontario. Now, just for uh, reference, um, uh, in the upper left, if we had more room in this map, uh, Toronto is about 80 minutes from Buffalo, and it's a beautiful visit. If you haven't been to Buffalo or, or cross into uh, Ontario, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to spend some time. Uh, you can easily spend a couple days in, in Niagara Falls, and Toronto is just a, a world-class city that's, that's a delight. So to get to the falls from Buffalo, you can drive along the right side of the river if you like. You're going to drive along a local roads. It's, it's probably a 30, 40 minute ride that way. You can also go over the Grand Island Bridge uh, onto Grand Island and then it's a, a pretty quick poke across the uh, uh, Grand Island there and then you'll go on some more bridges to back to the mainland and then you can drive along the river there and end up in Niagara Falls, New York. Or if you like, you can drive over the Peace Bridge here at Buffalo and if you drive over the Peace Bridge, Right here is Fort Erie. That's where that world, uh, uh, that War of 1812 battle occurred there and uh, at Fort Erie. And you can drive along the uh, Niagara River here on the Canadian side, and, and it's much slower. It's about uh, 30 or 35 miles an hour, but it is absolutely beautiful. There are wonderful homes you'll see on your left, and then you'll see the Niagara River on your right. The gardens are absolutely wonderful. It is a real treat. So um, we usually try, uh, if we have time, to go the Canadian side and then sometimes come back over the Grand Island bridges when we go. So let's uh, show so, uh, a pictorial version of this. Buffalo would be up at the top, maybe 20 minutes away. And um, the, if we go on the top, this would be on that nice scenic drive um, along uh, the Niagara River in Canada. And you would end up here at the Horseshoe Falls. This falls here is uh, the Horseshoe Falls. It's 2,200 feet from the uh, left side of the falls in an arc shape over to the right side there. And this is Goat Island that uh, is a state park in uh, New York State Park. And then here's the American Falls. There's the, the Bridal Falls. I can go in a little bit here. A lot more rocks are at the base of the uh, American Falls here. We've seen um, many of our images today have been taken right about here on the left side of the American Falls facing that way. So that's what we've seen. We've seen the mist of the uh, Horseshoe Falls. And uh, so if you drove across the uh, Grand Island bridges, you would probably come up this way. You can then uh, cross over to Goat Island and park. It's a, it's a delight, uh, a great way to enjoy some nature there. Um, overall, uh, Niagara Falls, New York has uh, come and go at different times. It's, it's uh, had its moments. Uh, today there's a casino. There's certainly nice restaurants there. And there is a, uh, a nice aquarium as well. This is the Rainbow Bridge, which would take you from the uh, United States over here to Canada. The Canadian side is absolutely terrific. It is without parallel. Uh, if you want to uh, enjoy gardens, flowers, nature, uh, attractions. Look at the, the water here. The rapids, by the way, start here. There's some, uh, uh, we'll get to it in the next slide. There's a couple cables that go across the river that say uh, you need to get out of the water or you're going over the falls. And uh, another one you can, it, it, of the wires starts right around the rapids as the water speeds up and goes over the falls into the Niagara Gorge. But on the Canadian side here, there's a lot of museums, 
there's a place in the lower right here that would go uh, further to the right, Clifton Hill, great place for families, uh, families, parents, grandparents, kids love it. There's a lot of souvenir shops and game rooms and funny attractions, Ripley's Believe It or Not museums and the, the Criminal Hall of Fame and all sorts of crazy, trashy, touristy stuff and a uh, lot of great stuff. You can easily spend a couple days here. And as many know, it's, it's also known as the honeymoon capital of the world. Here's another uh, nice picture. This was taken uh, in the morning, an aerial shot, kind of an odd uh, pic panorama though, because the, the road here in the lower left actually connects with the road here in the, the lower right. But it gives you an idea again, Buffalo would be over here in the upper right here. Here's the ride along the Canadian uh, drive there. Uh, if you went over Grand Island, you would come this way and arrive at uh, Niagara Falls, New York here. And here's where you can get over to Goat Island and park and a beautiful place to see the uh, uh, Horseshoe Falls from the American side. Not everyone can come over the border, whether for logistical reasons or sometimes legal reasons. So it, it both sides of the, um, the border are uh, beautiful places to enjoy Mother Nature and some of its uh, wonders there. So here's the water as it goes over. Uh, it does freeze in the winter. It gets totally frozen, but water constantly goes over the falls 24-7, 365 days a year, and uh, just goes underneath the ice and down the river here. This is where it goes towards the bridge and whirlpool. So uh, the bridge in that stamp would uh, used to be here, uh, just in front of this rain current rainbow bridge, and it would go down uh, the river a little further. It, it would essentially hit a, a a granite wall and does forms like a, a whirlpool thing, and then it goes further out, and that is probably Lake Ontario in the distance here near the the sunrise. So that gives you an idea of the geography of the area. Um, before I go to the next slide, imagine yourself being right above the mist here on the Canadian side, driving towards the falls, and this is what you would see. There's the mist in the distance here coming up from the um, uh, street level of the Horseshoe Falls. Now, I remember uh, as a kid, there were a number of towers. Uh, the one in the middle is actually the best. It's the Skyline Tower. Uh, it's got an absolutely terrific um, restaurant on top that revolves. It takes an hour to go around and uh, it's, it's quite pricey, but it's wonderful. It's quality food. Uh, in the basement of the Skyline Tower is a small amusement park. I've been on bumper cars there with my late uncle, uh, who was a stamp collector, and uh, uh, there's gift shops as well. This uh, tower to the far right has had different names. I believe when I was a youngster, it was the Oneida Tower. This one over here uh, towards the left used to be the Seagram's Tower. I think now they're they're named after corporations like T-Mobile or something like that. But uh, Skyline is is right there. And if you're ever able, um, you certainly can go up to the observation level without um, uh, going to the restaurant. And it's a definite uh, must do. So that's the view from here. Another view from street level. This is on the Canadian side. And this looks at the... Uh, uh, Horseshoe Falls and the mist coming up from street level. Now in the summertime, it is packed, especially on summer uh, sunny days. Uh, there are people from all over the world that come to Niagara Falls. You see all ages, all shapes and sizes and ethnicities, and it's a real fun melting pot. It's a wonderful festive occasion. And I'm sure uh, uh, Mr. George Eastman probably sold a lot of uh, film there when we all used film cameras instead of digital cameras. Here's a, an image of the American Falls from the same Canadian vantage point on the Canadian side. This looks over to uh, Niagara Falls, New York, and here's the Bridal Falls and then the American Falls. And uh, then we've got another shot that shows the gorge, the American Falls, and the Maid of the Mist boat. Now, the Maid of the Mist boats is actually a, a more than one boat. One leaves from the United States side at a dock over here. Uh, and one leaves from the Canadian side. These boats have been in operation since 1846, and they are a real joy to experience. You just get on an elevator and you go from street level down to dock level, and they give you a little plastic bag type 
raincoat included in your fare and the boat takes off either from the American side or the Canadian side and goes down the river right to the base of the Horseshoe Falls. And it is a thrill. You're, you can do this on a sunny day. You can do it on a rainy day. You're going to get wet and it is a lot of fun. And uh, it takes you right up to the rocks there of the falls. You can really hear it. You can feel the power. You know, Niagara Falls is not the largest falls in the world by any stretch. It's 167 feet tall. The largest falls is in Venezuela, I think around 3,000 3, or 3,200 feet. But this has is remarkable because of the volume of water that goes over the falls and the power of the falls. So that's why people go to see it. And uh, not just everyday folks, but famous people go to the falls. Marilyn Monroe filmed her um, 1952 movie there, Niagara. And uh, the uh, Princess uh, Diana came with her then young sons, Harry and, and Harry here on the left and well, Prince William in the middle there. And they went on the Maid of the Mist too, um, to enjoy the experience. Here's uh, uh, myself and my lovely wife, Christine on the boat. Uh, this is 2007 with the American Falls behind us. And uh, it was just so much fun. So I encourage you to try that if you are spending some time at Niagara. Um, I'll continue the, the family connection here. This is the last time I was at Niagara Falls. It's February of 2016 with my dear late brother, Dave. And he uh, we were meeting in Buffalo and he said, we've got to go to the falls. And we drove through a snowstorm on the Canadian side to arrive here. It was so cold. Uh, I got to tell you, we were um, outside for just 60 seconds to take this selfie. The biting wind was so cold, it made our cheeks hurt. Um, the wind was such a factor there, the wind chill factor. But I'm, I'm glad I got to experience that with my brother. And uh, right over my my left shoulder here on the right side of the slide is how close you can get to the water going over. In between us, you can kind of see this railing and look what it is. Here's another shot. You can get really close to this water. It is the best place to see and experience Niagara from. This is on the Canadian side. If you remember that slide with the mist uh, in the distance looking at the, uh, the towers and the skyline and stuff, that would have been taken from over here. But this railing, um, is a great place to view it from. In the summertime, you're probably gonna wait. Uh, there's two, three, four people deep to uh, see the falls from this spot, but it's worth it. People are kind and you can get your picture and then let others uh, come on up. And it is a magical, magical experience. So uh, look what they did. This wasn't just uh, current uh, tourists doing this, but this is how they looked at it years ago when there was no railing. Could you imagine being out on these rocks on the falls uh, to experience this? One slip and it's it's doomsday for you. Nice sunny day, but uh, boy, how uh, courageous or crazy you might have been to uh, experience it in that way. So I want to talk to talk uh, to you now about a, another historical bit of Niagara. This occurred in 1969. I happened to be a paper boy then for a little while. And uh, here I am with my uh, Buffalo Evening News bag. And one day that I was delivering on the front of the Buffalo News was a picture like this. And it showed Niagara Falls, the American Falls, totally dried up. This is in June of 1969. And they what they did is, here's uh, the entrance, here's the Niagara River where the water comes in. And uh, they put they took dump trucks full of dirt and and uh, rocks and they filled it up as best they could to divert the water from coming over the American Falls. They wanted a trickle of it to come over so that the, the sun wouldn't completely uh, dry out the rocks completely. But uh, they did this to study the rock formations. They did it to uh, learn about erosion. They don't want the falls to erode uh, very quickly for a variety of reasons, natural reasons, tourist reasons, whatever. So uh, in, did they, the, the water didn't all actually go to the right over the Niagara, uh, the Horseshoe Falls. There are large intakes and tunnels, both on the US side and the Canadian side. And that's how they generate electricity. Water goes through these tunnels to the uh, uh, left here on the US side to the Robert Moses power plant. 
and uh, it, it, it turns these giant turbines, and that's how we get electricity. It actually powered electricity uh, uh, from the falls, powered the eastern seaboard in almost all of New York City early on when they got this thing going. But this is Niagara Falls in 1969 um, when they dried it up. That picture that I saw on the front of the Buffalo Evening News had people walking down here with five-gallon buckets full of coins that people had thrown for decades over the rail to make a wish. And so there were Indian head pennies and all sorts of coins here that they were carting off there. Uh, unfortunately, they found some um, skeletons down there of people that had gone over the falls, um, probably uh, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, but um, they also did their uh, due diligence and figured out uh, learned about the rocks and the formations and things. They decided to leave the uh, rocks there as is. Um, and uh, no one has ever survived going over the American Falls, by the way. Uh, this is a little over 100 feet drop as opposed to 167 at the Horseshoe Falls. But uh, uh, the rocks are what um, uh, does you in on impact there. So this was definitely a historical moment at the Falls area. And uh, so next, let's talk about the bridges of Niagara Falls. Uh, in 1848 to 1855, for seven years, there was called the Falls Suspension Bridge. It was a walking only bridge to get from the United States to Canada or vice versa. And in 1855, uh, oh, by the way, here's another picture of uh, that uh, American Falls all dried up and some of the workers there uh, uh, doing their deal. And you can see there, there's a cement mixer there. So they were reinforcing things. They took a lot of samples, as I recall. So uh, quite a uh, scientific uh, task. But uh, onto the bridges. Here's the, the second bridge that uh, uh, went over Niagara from the US to Canada at Niagara Falls. This is called the Railway Suspension Bridge. This was in use from 1855 to 1896. And uh, you can see there's trains on top. Here's another nice view of it. Trains are on top and peoples and buggies were on the lower level. Uh, it had to be redone or reinforced around 1877 after 22 years uh, in, because the wood slats had to be changed out for steel because the loads of uh, trains coming over and their payloads and, and things were just too heavy for uh, the wooden uh, uh, slats to endure. So in 1897, we have the, ah, here's another, this is a bridge that uh, is still there. It's called the Whirlpool Rapids Bridge or the Lower Bridge. Now this is a train only bridge that uh, uh, goes across uh, 1897 to now. So we're talking uh, around 120, four years or so, and it's it's still in use. But in 1897, we also uh, saw another bridge uh, being constructed, and this is the Falls View Bridge. It had several names, actually, the Upper Steel Arch Bridge, or the Falls View Bridge, or uh, here they call it the Steel Arch Bridge. It opened in 1897. This is a, a button from my uh, collection that uh, is pretty neat. And it's also called the Honeymoon Bridge. But here's a picture of the Steel Arch Bridge, 840 feet across the, it was the largest steel arch in the world. Uh, trolley cars and pedestrians uh, could certainly pass on one level. It was wide enough for both to go across either way. Here's the Maid of the Mist there. Now look where the uh, uh, bottom stanchions of the bridge are located right at uh, river or gorge level, right there on the rocks. That certainly is going to be impactful. Here's another view of the bridge at the falls. Uh, there's the bottom of it there at the gorge. Uh, quite a structure. Here's uh, another image from gorge level and uh, a pretty amazing sight. Here it is on a, uh, a postcard, a picture postcard, the Upper Steel Arch Bridge connecting the U.S. and uh, Canada. And uh, here's a postcard showing the steel arch bridge from the Canadian side driving over to the U.S. side. 
you've got at this time more cars coming to Canada. There's the trolley car coming and cars uh, going from Canada to the US and then there's the pedestrian portion there. So um, a lot of traffic and commerce certainly uh, goes from one side to the other. And uh, here's the Maid of the Mist. Uh, now the Maid of the Mist has a variety of boats. As I mentioned, they started in 1847, but uh, the service uh, had a variety of boats, but uh, uh, regardless of what they look like, they certainly have done their uh, task and entertained a lot of people with them. This is in the summer. Now here's the steel arch bridge or the uh, base of it here in the winter time. So you may recognize this bridge uh, in this stamp uh, of William B. Hale there. And uh, uh, that's the one that's on his bridge and whirlpool stamps. Now, high winds were a major factor that caused this bridge to sway. Quite often, the, uh, the winds nearly blew people and vehicles off the bridge. In 1930, uh, it had that wooden floor that became very slippery and then wet. And in one accident, a, a motorist crossing the bridge to Canada applied the brakes of his uh, automobile and skidded right off the bridge and into the gorge and uh, did not survive that one. Um, but uh, here are the um, is the bridge on this Cinderella stamp <coughs> appeared on this United States stamp. And you may know this from uh, being part of the six stamp series of Pan American Exposition related commemoratives, part of our first set of bicolor commemoratives issued by the Postal Department. Now, there were bicolor stamps issued in 1869, yet those are considered definitive stamps. And this and the other five stamps in this series are considered commemoratives from 1901. So transportation was the theme of the set. And so they put the bridge at Niagara Falls there. Here's an illustration of the uh, first, this is the first sketch of the bridge stamp. They're working on the uh, design of it. And uh, a man named Smith was doing the artwork for that. Here is a die proof, um, a beautiful engraving, just a, a nice classic design there. And uh, we'll get onto some more examples of the stamp itself. Here's a plate, you'd call a plate number sing single, I guess. Uh, uh, then we've got a, a block of four with this plate number. And what's interesting is most of the images that I've seen have this same 1140 plate number. Uh, this has the Bureau of Engraving and Printing notice in the selvage on the uh, lower left there. Here's a block of 10 and uh, a block of 20 corner block. And then even a block of or a pane of 50 stamps of this. Now, I mentioned the other stamps that were in this series. And uh, you may know that the one cent, two cent, and four cent uh, happen to wind up as invert stamps. These are the famous Pan American invert stamps. Uh, only a very few uh, were ever found for each of these three denominations. The five cent bridge stamp and the eight cent and 10 cent stamp uh, have never uh, been seen as inverts in this way. Uh, these go for tens of thousands of dollars, easily up in the $160,000 range. I remember seeing at auction, depending on condition. Uh, there's, I think, a 189 of one. There's just under 400 of another, but they're extremely difficult to find unless you buy the 2001 commemorative uh, souvenir sheet that was issued 100 years later, and you can find them for pennies there. Now, I am very, very uh, excited and honored um, to have this block of four of the bridge stamp uh, inverted with a beautiful Pan American Exposition uh, postmark on it, and uh, one of the very few to own this, and it only cost $10 to put this fake block in my collection. So uh, I'm kind of a uh, a sucker for novelty stamps too, as well as Cinderella's. So uh, this was a fun thing to, to add to my collection. Uh, it's not real and it's probably not worth more than $10, but a fun thing to have. Now, uh, one cover with the five cent stamp on it that's really rare is this one. It's one of only two known first day covers that has a single five cent stamp on it. This sold for $26,000. Most of the May 1st, 1901 covers with the Pan American Expo stamps on them 
either have the one cent, two cent, uh, or uh, a variety. Some have, there's more uh, with the entire set of six stamps on it than covers with just the five cent stamp alone on it. So that's what makes this very valuable. Here's a cover from uh, later on, a couple weeks later, not quite, uh, with the beautiful Pan American Expo um, cancellation on it. The Pan Am uh, cachet on the left with a couple Cinderella stamps. You've got the Charging Buffalo in the lower left and the Bison and Shield stamp on the uh, lower right there. Uh, another cover uh, was sent in August to Japan. And uh, this William E. Peck company was one of the chief exporting companies in the United States. So there's some beautiful postal markings here on this example. Uh, another use was this cover that went to South Africa. It was sent in August of 1901 and it didn't make it, it wasn't claimed. And so it was sent back to the United States. This uh, Washington cancellation upon return has a 1902 um, date on it. So uh, this stamp had a five or six month journey, uh, at least halfway around the world. So quite a, a fun thing to note there. Here's a cover that though plain, it was canceled on September 14th, 1901. And that happens to be the day that our president McKinley died. He was shot at the Pan Am uh, about a week earlier. So uh, covers dated September 14th are uh, collectible in their own right. Here's another uh, cover with the Pan Am Expo cancellation on it and the beautiful official Raphael Beck artwork on the left-hand side. This was sent to Europe on the 20th of uh, uh, September, 1901 from Buffalo. Here's one that went to Italy three days later. Interesting uh, placement of the stamp on this cover um, to note. And here's one, I love this cover. This was from September 25th to Tunisia in Africa. You can see the beautiful Arabic writing there, the cancellation, the placement of the stamp. I love the bison there. Uh, being honored with electricity on either side. And that's above the Niagara Falls image there with the maid of the mist over the uh, uh, North and South hemispheres, uh, uh, North and South America in the uh, Western hemisphere there. So uh, just a beautiful, beautiful cachet there that uh, is really a fun thing to note. So let's uh, move on to this one that has a Cinderella stamp and a pair of bridge stamps on it, a registered stamp sent within the US to New York City. So an advertising cover. Uh, you don't see too many Cinderella's uh, in this fashion. So that's kind of interesting here. Here's a cover that was sent to Queensland, Australia and was returned, uh, sent from Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, so we've seen a number of uh, covers in postal history, history. Let's return now to some uh, actual history at the falls. And this is the uh, Steel Arch Bridge in January of 1938. This is uh, uh, a beautiful image here that was taken. And what occurred is a sudden windstorm uh, on January 23rd of 1938 in Lake Erie sent a gigantic deluge of ice down the Niagara River and it went over the falls. Well, once it did, it clogged the, the gorge there. And we're looking at the ice as it clogged the gorge. And um, we noted that within 12 hours, the river below the falls was jammed with ice of such enormous proportions that the ice pressure pushed against the bridge abutments at the bottom and the hinge supports of the arch, and they caused severe structural damage we can see it here that the bridge actually buckled. And uh, it was only a matter of time before the bridge would collapse. The bridge remained intact uh, for several days. It drew thousands of people who came to wait uh, out the end of the bridge to come. And uh, one fella who had a, uh, uh, a workshop in the Niagara Gorge predicted on the 26th of uh, January there that the bridge would collapse this evening. And uh, he said that the Great Ice Bridge under the falls would cut loose within a few hours, 
and be swept against the bridge abutments and framework, and he doubted whether the bridge would withstand the resulting pressure, and uh, it actually didn't. It, uh, the bridge came down uh, at 4.20 p.m. on January 27th, the next day, 1938, when the, the span broke and fell into the gorge onto the ice in the river below. It fell in one piece, and uh, for safety's sake, uh, the bridge was later broken up into two parts with the use of dynamite. And uh, so we're going to show, uh, besides that little notice there that was in the paper, uh, this was a day of notice. The evening of January 27th uh, noted that the bridge had collapsed, and it was actually front page news across the United States. Here's the Des Moines Register. You've got the Fort Worth Star Telegram noting that Niagara's famous honeymoon bridge crashes into dizzy ice ice choked gorge there. And um, so another headline from the Pottstown, Pennsylvania Mercury uh, certainly was pretty dramatic there and uh, shows that uh, uh, it was an event to be reported all across the country. So uh, the uh, bridge itself was broken into two pieces by use of dynamite, actually. Uh, here it is, a couple more images of it and the, uh, the residue of what was left there. This is all wood. Remember, this one had a wooden span supported underneath it by steel. Um, and so look at it all cracked there. You can see these folks um, assessing the damage. And uh, uh, here's some men near the, the steel girder. And uh, uh, the two pieces of the center span uh, after it was broken apart by dynamite, they remained on the ice for about 10 weeks, uh, mid-April, um, maybe maybe almost 12 weeks, when ice broke apart and the two pieces eventually uh, disappeared underneath the, uh, the uh, Niagara River there. So wreckage began to sink into the Niagara River today. Uh, at 710 on the 12th, uh, part of it went into uh, below the water surface. The center section went uh, into the river about an hour later. And then later that day, the remaining Canadian portion of the bridge at about 3.30 in the afternoon floated down the river on an ice flow. And uh, the uh, ice flow is shown here in this Ottawa newspaper that uh, says the famous honeymoon bridge disappears with King Winter. And... Uh, uh, the section rolled off the flow and sank into the water into what is believed the deepest part of the Niagara River at that point. So I'm really grateful that on that trip that my brother and I took when we were in the pavilion getting hot chocolate after we took that picture, uh, we noticed uh, things about the Rainbow Bridge. This was what would replace the uh, Steel Arch Bridge. They formed a committee months later in August it met, and then they drew up plans in the fall of uh, 1938 to design the what is now the current Rainbow Bridge, and they uh, here is shown being worked on in July of 1941. Here is the finished bridge. Now that was taken on that day my brother and I were there, so this is what we get to see here today. Canada on the left and the uh, United States on the right. Uh, Niagara Falls, New York on the right, and Niagara Falls, Ontario on the left. And I'm so glad, too, that the Niagara Parks um, have wonderful exhibits there. If you go to any of the visitors' bureaus, you can see this one, uh, a placard on the Honeymoon Bridge collapse. One thing that I note here as I close, that since 1964, an ice boom has been installed at Lake Erie to prevent ice flows from entering the Niagara River, reducing the size of ice of the ice bridge uh, that's below Niagara Falls and decreases the amount of damage along the river. If we go back a, a slide here, you can see that the uh, uh, new bridge isn't so such in the, uh, in the gorge itself. It's not at risk of uh, damage from ice. So uh, anyhow, that's what has, uh, we've learned from the honeymoon bridge collapse. And that concludes my talk. I hope that you've enjoyed the stories. Uh, Dr. Charlie's gonna follow up with something really fun here. I wanna thank you for listening and uh, 
Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer what I can. Um, my stamp related and other interesting uh, uh, posts related to my book are at this Facebook page, which is free to look at. You don't even have to be on Facebook. There's my email address. And if you're so inclined to check out the book, it's available from the American Philatelic Society, as well as Amazon and eBay. So thank you so much for listening. I'm going to stop the share here and turn it over to Dr. Charlie to uh, finish things off with a, a fun little clip. Let's give a round of applause while I tee up the video. Just a phenomenal presentation, Rick. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, let me get to the video because then I know we'll get to Q&A because uh, I know there's definitely some questions. So let's share. Uh, and I'm going to put it on. And let's see if we can get this to play. So I presume you can see that? Yes. All right, let me hit play and we'll see if you can get the video, the audio. The audio is kind of light, so I'll narrate. There Please. were there were photographers, uh, this one from the BBC, I guess, that were standing by for days waiting to see whether the bridge would actually collapse. And uh, so he's noting uh, the expanse of the steel arch and what a remarkable structure it is. And there it shows uh, the ice being pushed into the base of the bridge and crumpling some of the steel while it was still supported. And in a moment here, it's gonna show the actual uh, uh, destruction of the bridge itself on the 27th. Uh, there it goes into the gorge. This fellow was able to capture the moment it happened. And uh, this is on YouTube, by the way, this newsreel. It's uh, really fun to uh, uh, view. There's other uh, news on the reel. So I edited this and provided it to Dr. Charlie. And uh, it certainly is a fun thing to go check out if you're able. So thanks for posting that, Charlie. Well, my pleasure. I, I know you couldn't hear the audio. It was even low on my end, but I think you did a better job narrating it than uh, the fellow that was there. So so thank you again. Um, let's have a round of applause for Rick, please. And I definitely know we've got some questions. Just thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just a note from a Brit. The British Movie Tone News was quite popular, I guess, from... Well, certainly when I grew up, was growing up, and any time you went to the movies, ah. cinema, in between the different, the, the first movie and the second movie, you had a news clip, and it was always British movie tone news, and clips from around the world and events like this. It's, uh, well, there you go. That was one of them, uh, Mike. So you, you yeah, probably yeah. might have, you might have seen that one, uh, but so... Uh, Great talk, Rick. I know we had a couple questions too. One, I mean, is the border open now? I am not sure if the border is open today, but it might be. But what is an ice boom is the first question, and then we'll open it up for everybody else, please. First of all, the, the uh, we're still restricted from going from the U.S. to Canada. Their rollout of vaccine has uh, occurred at a different pace than ours, and so uh, uh, there's still restrictions. Uh, there's a very few folks that if you have family in Canada, you can go across, but it's, it's pretty limited. And the hope is, is that it will open up sometime this summer. Uh, Niagara Falls, New York is certainly benefiting a bit from uh, the closure, but uh, everyone wants to go over and enjoy the experience this summer, I'm sure. The ice boom, um, what I gather is, it's, it's uh, imagine a, a, a large uh, I, it's either a, a, a structure, I'm not sure whether it's a movable structure, but it's something that's put near the mouth of the Niagara River in Lake Erie there near Buffalo, or really right in the harbor area of Buffalo, uh, so that uh, the ice can't get into the Niagara River, only smaller portions of ice, and that, that can go over uh, the falls. I, I looked for, and I've happened to have been to the falls one other time that I remember in 1997 in the uh, uh, winter time. And boy, it's, it's a heck of a, uh, a sight to see. And as I say, the water does go over the falls, but then it goes uh, right under the ice and further down the river. Um, I'm not sure whether there's ice all the way 
you know, to the whirlpool, or uh, I would think with the motion of the water, that would probably preclude some ice from forming there at the whirlpool, but it then would go off into uh, the lower levels there into Lake Ontario. But uh, an ice boom is some kind of structure that allows for the uh, uh, deterrent of ice to get into the Niagara River. Thank you, Rick. I want to clarify too, because I have plate blocks and I know you mentioned the plate block and you, you saw that number. I mean, they only issued for each of the series. There was a separate plate for the frame and there was a separate plate for the vignette. So 1140 was for the frame and 1141 was for the vignette. And when you have the block of six or eight or 10, you would capture both of those blocks on the adjacent stamps at the bottom. One would be in black, and in your case, one would be in blue. Uh, and so you would see those two different plate numbers, and those were specific for each. And the Pan Am series, the one cent had multiple plates for vignettes and frames. So did the two cent. But the four cent had a single for each. The five cent had a single for each. The eight cent, and then the 10 cent. The, 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 the lower values had multiples, just so sure. you would know from a clarification on thank, the police. Thank you. And the lower values would have had more because they would have sold more one cent that, and two that's cents. That's exactly cents. right. More commonly used the one and two yeah. cents. So they had more prelates to be able to print more sheets and panes, et cetera. Definitely. But one for each of the four, five, eight, and 10. Yep. Yeah. Def and you know, an interesting note is that those stamps that came out on May 1st, the opening day of the Pan American Exposition were taken off sale on November 1st, the, the expo closed on the 2nd, but they were taken off just uh, six months later. So um, very yeah. short, short little lifespan there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, please, for Rick? Just hey, on. Rick and uh, Charlie, being a Buffalo native, I can explain the ice boom. Great. If, if you picture railroad ties, but much longer and much thicker, and they are chained together so they can move with the water and the ice and they're put up near the peace bridge uh in the late fall and it holds the ice back into lake erie and that then the water intakes down the niagara river don't get jammed up because they used to get ice breakers that have to go constantly to keep the ice out of the water intakes otherwise we'd lose the electricity but over the years all Western New York people complain because they left these ice booms until like May 1st. And it would prolong the winter and, you know, decrease springtime because all that ice sitting there. So now they let it out much earlier. But I grew up in a boating family and, you know, middle of May, everybody wants to be out on the river on their boats and you still have ice going down the river. Sure. And, so. and that river, thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate that clarification. You know, that map we showed that had uh, Grand Island on it, there's so much wonderful activity that occurs uh, boating on those, you know, whether it's the Tonawanda side or the Chippewa side, uh, their people are fishing, they're picnicking on the sides there. It's, it's a delightful um, summer place to go boating as long as you don't, uh, you know, you stay within uh, reason of the the rapids there further down the gorge, but uh, yeah. Hey Rick, I have a question because you showed us, which was fascinating. I had never seen that before. The 69 damming up at least of the American side where they did the geological raw, you know, work and all of that, which was pretty amazing. Now you're going to make me research that some more. Uh, and you were there for that. Did they ever do the comparable on the Canadian side on the horseshoe side, but they never stopped that to look never. and study that. Is that never. right? Never. I believe that the one thing that I, I, in in reading further about that was the you know the concern is erosion early in some of the earlier books that I I read um, said that there won't be a Niagara Falls in two thousand years and things like that but they have somehow adjusted the water flow um, for the manufacture of electricity through those giant uh, tunnels I guess on each side of the the, the river to um, make the erosion less. And they said what used to be um, one meter every, ten, uh, every year might now be one meter every 10 years. So um, I, I don't think they needed to necessarily turn off the, the uh, Horseshoe Falls for that kind of research. One of the reasons that they did turn off the American Falls 
uh, water that summer was they they thought that those rocks were just in the way and all that stuff and they thought they would get rid of them but uh, for some reason they concluded no this is mother nature let's just uh, leave it as is hey rick thank you yes. hey can i can i say something please sure, bob hey yeah. rick i i i read somewhere where they were planning to uh block uh, american falls again wow so that they could fix the uh, 1908 bridge that is stone going across to the island and uh I'm not sure if that's on hold or what, but that was in the works. Well, have I, you heard I, anything about that? I haven't read it. the The other bridge that uh, is still there, the one that's just train traffic, I think it's near the Lewiston. Well, I'm talking about the uh, the, the the bridge that goes to the is it Goat Island? Oh, that bridge. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I don't. Maybe they replaced it already. I don't know. They were going to fix it up. Right, right. I I, I understand. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I do recall that they were trying to see if there were possibilities to uh, replace the bridge without turning it off and what kind of a uh, project that yeah, would be. It was and, either coffer dam or, to, or turn the falls off. Sure, sure. Yeah, but no, I appreciate you bringing it up, Bob, because I, yeah. I would like to know the answer uh, and present status of that myself. Yeah. I got a couple uh, the comment, Rick. Sure. Um, one was uh, one of the covers with the international five cent rate went to Vienna and uh, to the Kaiserin Maria Theresa. That's a kind of a fancy name that, that goes with it. Um, somebody well known. And then uh, the other one, some of the postcards, I think you're alluding to it was showing the falls and they almost, I don't know if it was artistic license or a photograph free touch, but it looked like it was almost going straight across. But the newer ones show that erosion in the dents. Was a hundred years ago, was that a much closer, uh, or more straight appearance to the New York side falls? Yes. Not really. Um, you're talking, um, you know, a matter of feet rather than yards as far as erosion is concerned. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that a lot of those linen postcards that were hand drawn, uh, yeah. some of them from photos, um, you know, they either took liberties or, or just didn't do due diligence to make them accurate as they might. And, yeah. uh, but uh, it's pretty much been a horseshoe, uh, you know, configuration. Even older photographs taken well over 100 years ago show that. Show that. Okay. You know, one of the things you mentioned about the postcards that they do take liberty is, is the coloring. Because they make these things look like, you know, bright neon colors that jump out like crazy uh, off of those linen postcards. And it's a much more subtle but really interesting effect when you see them in person. Great, thank you. Thanks, Paul. I'd like thank to add you. something to the about the postcards. Yes, yeah, sure, Bob. The um, earliest falls postcard was printed on UX10 with a half tone image of uh, the, the, the American Falls, and it was January 1893 was the earliest. Soon after that, somebody got the idea of pasting photographs of the falls, prospect point on UX-10, and there's a little notice on the card that says patent applied for. And I have one mailed, and, I, and apparently that was illegal. You couldn't paste something on a postal card. What so does it say on the card? What was pasted on it? A picture, a photographic picture, one inch by two inches of Prospect Point. Gotcha. And it was actually, says patent applied for it. And I have like five copies of these things, different, different views of the falls. So somebody was trying to come up with a better way of predict showing the falls using photographs pasted to UX10. Great, great. That's very cool. Very cool. I love hearing the earliest known usage. You know, in the postcard collecting world, there's also what's called as uh, real photo postcards that you literally took the picture with your camera and had it developed as uh, on the back instead of being blank, it would say postcard with a line down it. You could put a stamp on it and mail it to your friend or family. And uh, so there, and each one is unique. Mine would be different than what you took on your uh, adventure. And uh, so uh, yeah. there's, you know, a number of those, but the standard sellable postcards as we know it, um, they're likely around 1905, 1906. I think the, the earliest ones I have are in, in those two years. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions for Rick, please? Again, another a fascinating program with some great Q&A. Just great Q&A. And uh, let's take, and Joy, I see Joyce. Let's give a round of applause because, you know, having, having you guys here has just been phenomenal. And we thank you. We thank you. I can't wait till you take us on another journey, Rick. I don't know what it's going to be, but, you know, you guys go to some interesting places. You got to come back and give us another talk in the future. Well, Charlie, can you hear me? I can, please. Who is okay. that? Ben? I just had to unmute myself. Um, yeah, there I'd like you go. to make a comment, if I may, about Rick's sure. presentation. Of course. Um, if we collect stamps or covers to look at, period, um, that's admiring fine art, and it's wonderful. It's um, uh, certainly proper. But I think with what Rick did, he took flatly and he merged it with history, travel, uh, geology, and threw in some personal experiences. And to me, that made for a really rich experience for all of us. And I certainly appreciate it, as I'm sure our other uh, members tuned in tonight did. Thank yeah. you, Al. You know, that means a lot. And I want to just, uh, instead of just saying thank you, the follow-up for me is that sometimes I've wondered whether this isn't a serious enough talk. You know, it doesn't talk about perforation sizes and watermarks and things like that. But it is a, a, a share that is accessible to, I feel, anyone could enjoy. Well, mm -hmm. Rick, if I may make a comment about your presentation, you lost me a couple of times. And the reason why you lost me is uh, your presentation on Niagara. My wife and I took our honeymoon there. And what it did, it simulated my mind memories of our honeymoon. So it, when I tuned you out, it wasn't you. It was my mind going back to our honeymoon. Were you on the honeymoon bridge, Al? Uh, no, we weren't, <laughs> but we certainly enjoyed it. This helped relive some memories. Yeah, great. And that's the whole point. And that's what I love about this sort of these meetings and this storytelling yeah. is the merging and mixing of all of these different media to just relay, right? You just webbed a great tale. And to get to see some pictures of Rick when he was young delivering newspapers. I mean, hey, who, <laughs> you don't get to see that every day. Uh, I just want to say <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Just a phenomenal, phenomenal story. And we and the good news is we have this recorded and we will edit it appropriately. And you'll be able to see this on our YouTube channel, which will be great. And then we'll we'll share this far and wide. It's just just a phenomenal story, Rick. So thank, thank you, Charlie. In following up, I, I just want to thank you that, you know, everybody here in the, the Zoom meeting, uh, you know, uh, two years ago, I had never met any of you until Mike had invited me to the to share in the uh, uh PSLC meeting there. And, you know, what a wonderful way for my world to open up because of you all in Lancaster County. So thank you for enriching my life. 